Hey everyone, before we start the show today, we'd like to remember Michelle Hansen, who passed away in December after a short battle with cancer. Michelle was the previous chair of the certification committee, and she played an instrumental role in a lot of what David and I talk about today. Here's Michelle's good friend and ATA colleague, Corinne McKay. This is Corinne McKay, ATA past president, sharing a remembrance of Michelle Hansen. Michelle and I knew each other for more than 10 years through ATA and through a translation company in Geneva, Switzerland, that we both worked for doing vaccine-related translations. As soon as I met Michelle, she would be the person I'd look for in the breakfast room at ATA meetings. We shared many meals and late-night work sessions when I was on the board, and she could always be counted on to add a smart, level-headed perspective and a great sense of humor to any translation-related discussion. When things on a translation project went horribly wrong and the rest of us were freaking out, Michelle would be quietly and competently solving the problem in the background. In recent years, Michelle and I became closer friends when she started teaching classes for my company, Training for Translators, and we talked frequently, plus we started a tradition of having lunch at the ATA conference every year talking not only about work, but about our shared love of animals and the adventures of parenting our young adult daughters. We presented together at the conference about international development translation, and I was in awe of Michelle's subject matter expertise. I guess I have a little bit of an online course addiction, she told me once, <laughs> and I still cannot believe that the lunch we shared in Minneapolis at the end of October is the last time I would see her in person. Our entire translator community is in shock and so sad at the loss of Michelle, who was liked and admired by everyone who knew her. I always hoped that we could take a Europe trip together someday, and the next time I'm drinking wine by a beautiful lake in Switzerland, I will definitely raise a glass to Michelle. The students in Michelle's medical translation classes truly loved her, asking me, how much time does it take her to prepare these classes? And commenting, I'd take anything she teaches just for the pleasure of learning from her. One even said in the class survey, Michelle, do you want to marry me? <laughs> That's how much everyone loved her. And every interaction with her had a human touch. She'd joke about trying to keep her dog from barking at the UPS truck during an online class, and she always had something fun going on. When she mentioned a trip to go grape stomping during the wine harvest in southern France, and I asked her what the motivator for that trip was, she answered, why not, and laughed. Michelle's life was much too short, but she lived it to the fullest. In spearheading the transition to the online ATA certification exam, a project that I know took countless hours of her time in the last year, and in so many other ways, she left a mark on the translation profession that will not be forgotten. I know that when I attend the ATA conference in Los Angeles this year, there will be an empty place where Michelle should be. Thanks so much for those words, Corinne. Now let's start today's show. Welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird. Each month on the podcast, we bring you news and insights from the American Translators Association. We look at what's happening at ATA, explore the benefits of membership, and discuss the translation and interpreting professions. You know, the T&I industry is changing rapidly. We hope this podcast will help you keep up with it. ATA was founded over 60 years ago to advance the translation and interpreting professions and foster the professional development of individual translators and interpreters. We have nearly 10,000 members in some 100 countries. If you'd like to know more about ATA, we'll have some information for you at the end of the show. you also find links in the notes. All right, let's start off with a few quick announcements. Listen up, translators and interpreters. The website for ATA's 63rd annual conference is now online. Visit ata63.org to get a glimpse of what's in store for us in Los Angeles this coming October. 
You'll also find a link to book a hotel room at a discounted rate. Registration opens in mid-July. Also, have you heard of ATA Tech Talks? ATA's Language Technology Division has recently launched a new quarterly webinar series. ATA Tech Talks will provide a platform for leading language tech companies to say hello, offer insights, and answer questions relevant to the work of freelancers, language service providers, and in-house translation departments. ATA members attend for free. Non-members pay just $25. The next Tech Talk takes place in July. And finally, the American Foundation for Translation and Interpretation, or AFTI, has announced a new ATA Membership Diversity Award. Thanks to a generous gift from ATA member Lucy Gunderson, AFTI will offer a limited number of ATA memberships each year to individuals joining ATA for the first time who self-identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color. Visit AFTI.org for more details. Joining me now is David Stevenson. David is the chair of ATA's certification committee. He is an ATA certified translator in German, Dutch, and Croatian to English, and has been an independent translator for over 30 years. His specializations include civil litigation, corporate law, economic development, and creative nonfiction. David can be reached at david at bullcitylang.com. David, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here, Matt. Right on. Well, of course, we're talking about ATA certification today, the ATA certification exam. So let's get right into it. Let's start out by talking about ATA certification. What does it mean to be an ATA certified translator? And what does it take to earn and maintain the credential? Well, Matt, uh, ATA certification is the most highly respected translation credential in the U.S., um, it attests to a high level of competence in accurately and naturally translating texts on a variety of topics. And the result is translations that are publishable after routine editing and proofing. Successful candidates typically have some amount of experience or training as translators. Um, certification is awarded after a candidate passes a written exam of roughly 500 words in a three hour time frame. Uh, individuals must also complete an ethics module and undergo continuing education in order to maintain their certification. And they must also retain ATA membership. What are the exam passages like and how are they graded? Well, exam passages are general. They require no specialized knowledge, apart from obviously a certain amount of knowledge of the world. Uh, the subject matter can be most anything, as long as it's not too controversial or anything that's potentially upsetting to candidates. The exam is stressful enough without upsetting the candidates by what they're reading. Um, the candidate is shown three passages of roughly 250 words each and must choose two of them to translate. Graders use a scale with error points of one, two, four, eight, or 16 points, depending on the severity of the error and its impact on the usefulness of the translation. And then a passing score is 17 points or less on each of the two passages. Why did ATA begin offering the certification exam online? Well, making the exam more accessible has long been on our wish list. Um, as with so much else, the pandemic caused us to re-examine our priorities because for most of 2020, our in-person sitting model was impossible, either because the gatherings were prohibited by local law or because the facilities such as universities where we held the sittings were closed. So that prompted us to begin looking at online testing in earnest. By last year, 2021, we had worked out a partnership with examroom.ai, which is an international remote testing platform. And we slowly began rolling out the online exam about a year ago. All right, now what has been the response so far? And how many people, for example, have taken the online exam? Last year, we administered the online exam to a little over 150 people, uh, compared with not quite 100 in person. And we expect to really far exceed those figures this year. Right on. Now, in the past, the certification exam has been an open book exam, typically taken in a room that's supervised by proctors. How does the online exam work? Uh, the online exam is in many ways just the same as in person. All print resources are permitted, um, and there are limits to internet resources that, that may be used. For example, no Google Translate or forums or chat features. And there are proctors observing to ensure compliance with the rules. 
But whereas the proctors are walking around looking over the candidate's shoulder during in-person sittings, in the online exam, the proctor is sharing the candidate's screen and observing him or her with front and back cameras and everything's being recorded, including audio for later review if that's warranted. So the security with the online exam is actually much more comprehensive and assuming there are no technical issues, it's also less intrusive for the candidate. Interesting. Now the online exam is now available on demand and that means ATM members can register and take the exam anytime, right? Tell us a little more about how that works. Well, last year, which was our launch year for online testing, we scheduled time slots during which candidates could register for the online exam. This allowed us to schedule ATA proctors in addition to exam room staff, since we couldn't rely on exam room to intervene if a candidate was using a prohibited website. They didn't, just didn't have the language knowledge and the experience with sites like DeepL. This year, instead of giving a candidates a list of sites they can't use, we're giving them an allow list. They're limited to a specific list of sites and they can't access anything else. This means that we don't need ATA proctors. And so that opens, opens the door to taking the exam anytime the candidate wants and anytime the exam room can accommodate them. So now candidates register on the ATA site, choosing they choose their language pair, they pay the fee, and then they're passed on to exam room. And then they directly schedule a time directly with exam room. So obviously this is a sea change in terms of accessibility and that combined with pinup demand from the last two years, as well as a couple of new language offerings, we do now do Korean in both directions. That means we're anticipating a busy testing year this year. So far we've had about 75 people sign up for the online exam in 2022, which means that in less than a month, we've had nearly half the online candidates we had for all of 2021. Wow, that, that is a lot right on. Well, that just goes to show you the demand is definitely definitely there. Now, will ATA continue to offer the in-person exam sittings as well? Yes, we've already had some this year and others are on the schedule. But bear in mind that in-person sittings are demand-driven, usually organized by chapters or affiliated groups. I'm aware of a couple of chapters that have decided not to hold a sitting this year and instead to refer their members to the online exam. Uh, one thing we'll probably drop is in-person sittings overseas since they're really expensive to stage. But in any event, we are planning to have two in-person sittings at this fall's conference in Los Angeles. But beyond that, we'll have to see how much demand there is. Okay. Now, you just mentioned uh, new language pair offerings. Um, how can I get testing started in my language pair if it's not already offered? Um, Well, getting a new language pair approved for testing is a demand-driven bottom-up process. The first step is documenting actual interest in earning certification in the new pair. Uh, Obviously, ATA doesn't want to invest resources in offering language pairs for which there's only a very small pool of potential candidates. Uh, Anyone who's interested in pursuing this can download the uh, full procedure from the ATA website. Now, the exam's overall pass rate, I understand, is less than 20%. Can you tell us why so many people fail the exam? Well, Matt, the the pass rate is a complicated matter, but there are a few patterns that we see over and over again. Uh, Many candidates aren't translating into their native or strongest language, and so their grasp of target language grammar and usage may not be up to par. And little mistakes in those areas can really add up. Um, Sometimes candidates are heritage speakers of their target language, and so while they may be fluent conversationally, they've never studied the language formally, and that shows through in the exam and and how they write. And sometimes people just aren't aware of the exam's rigor and think that getting certified is the first step in becoming a translator. It's not. Yeah, I'm actually a, a prime example of that. The first time I took the exam was very, very early in my career. But I wanted to take it. I was confident, but I'm pretty sure I failed miserably. I definitely felt that way when I walked out. That leads me to the next question. How can people know if they're ready for the exam? Well, by far the best way to gauge readiness for the exam is to take the practice test. Um, This is a retired exam passage that the candidate purchases and completes at home, then submits for grading. The graded test is then returned to the candidate with feedback. The big advantage of this, even for seasoned translators who feel they don't need practice, is that it allows the candidate to see the sort of text they'll encounter during the actual exam and get a sense of how graders apply our grading standards in practice. 
It's easy to order. It's affordable at $80 uh, for members or $120 for non-members. So uh, it's, it's really just strongly encouraged. Right on. Do you have any other tips for improving your chances of succeeding? Well, definitely read everything you can about the exam on the ATA website and in past issues of the Chronicle. Most especially, pay close attention to all the instructions you, you receive from ATA and from exam room if you're doing the online exam. This seems like a no-brainer, but it's amazing how many people show up at in-person sittings without a laptop. It's, it's bring your own. It's clearly spelled out in the, in the materials. We're thinking they'll be using MS Word rather than a plain text editor. Um, this is all addressed uh, again and again in the instructions. So, so really study those carefully and that'll save you and the proctors a lot of unnecessary stress. And also talk to others who have taken the exam and get any tips and, and insight they might have. That is a great point, that last one. And it's something that I did as well. And I, I know for a fact that, that helped me when I took the exam the second time. Uh, David, somebody uh, who's listening right now wants some more information, uh, then uh, where can they go to get more information about the certification exam? Well, again, the ATA website, uh, atanet.org, there's the very first tab on the far left is certification tab. So read everything you can there. Um, if you uh, have a question you're not, you're not finding the answer to there, you can write certification at atanet.org and someone will, uh, will answer your questions there. Right on, certification at atnet.org or check the website. It's very prominent right there. Right on, David. I think we've covered everything. Do you have any, uh, anything else you'd like to share? Any final words? Well, obviously we're thrilled about taking the exam online and making it more accessible. Um, this has taken so much work on the part of the certification committee, which is a really a truly dedicated group of people. But, but really the heavy list, lifting last year was done by two people and that's certification program manager, Karen Bailey and the late Michelle Hansen, my, my predecessor as committee chair, who is greatly missed. Well, thank you very much for that, David. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you for joining us. All right. Glad to be here, Matt. All right. That's a wrap. I'd like to thank everyone who helped produce the show today. Derek Platts mixed and edited the audio. And Mary David and Rashawn Pacarell at ATA headquarters provided editorial and technical support. If you learned anything new in today's podcast, I bet there's someone out there who would like to know it too. Don't be stingy. Tell them about the podcast. I've gotten to know so many great podcasts that way. I promise they'll thank you for it. And if you're not an ATA member, listen up. I've been a member for over 20 years. Joining ATA literally launched my freelance career, and I've never looked back. Nowadays, the demand for translators and interpreters is at an all-time high, but finding quality work isn't easy. ATA membership can make the difference. And ATA isn't just for translators and interpreters. Individuals, companies, and organizations can join. We have teachers and professors, hospital administrators, language company owners, technology developers, as well as language companies, universities, hospitals, and government agencies. If you'd like to know more, go to ATA's website, atanet.org. You can also check out past episodes of this podcast where we talk about the benefits of membership and what's currently happening in the association. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Talk to you again soon.